So my name is Dr. Corinne Davis Rodriguez, and I'm a member of the sociology department. And I'm going to be giving you a very introductory lecture about Brazilian society. Um, but before I do that, um, I just wanted to break the ice a little bit. Um, uh huh. Yeah. Eu sei. Ah, eu tenho que usar o microfone? Sim, por favor. Ah, tá. Você quer que use essa pode ou ser, essa? Você pode usar esse aqui, se eu confio mesmo. Só para ti. Ah, tá, porque eles estão fazendo a filmagem. Como... Ele já está. Ah, tá. Obrigado. Oh, well, I guess I have to use the microphone. Because I'm being filmed. Um, before I get started, because it is a Monday morning, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about myself and my participation in this program. Um, and then hear a little bit from you all about what you all were able to take advantage of uh, over the weekend. So I don't look like what one would stereotypically think a Brazilian looks like. Although as we're going to learn, Brazil is a very heterogeneous country. Um, I was not born in Brazil. I am a Brazilian citizen five years running now. Um, I was born in the United States and I decided to do my academic career here in Brazil. Um, I've been at UFMG since 2003 and I've been a professor in the department since 2006 and my substantive area is crime and justice within, uh, within sociology and also uh, moving into more of an emphasis now on urban sociology. So what I intend to do for you all today is give a very introductory overview of what is Brazilian society and talk about some of the main characteristics. Um, obviously, each of the points that I make and each of the areas that I talk about today in our lecture could easily occupy a full course. Um, and so I welcome any questions. I welcome any um, comments, uh, and I welcome any opinions or any knowledge that you all have brought, because I assume that the reason why you're here is because you're interested in Brazil, and usually when you're interested in a place, you minimally, minimally know something about it before you come. So I'm sure that many of you um, have some working knowledge of Brazil, have some information, and so I would be more than happy to talk about that as we go along through our lecture. Um, and so now I'd like to hear a little bit from you all um, about what you all were able to take advantage of this weekend, since as far as I understand this weekend, the university wasn't in charge of your programming, yes? You all were sort of on your own. So what sort of trouble did you all get into in our marvelous city? Did anyone go to any of the um, culture activities for the winter culture? What did you go see? Yes. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? What's your favorite Brazilian food so far? Ah, tropeiro. Anyone else? Huh? Acai. Acai. Yes, acai is very good. So how many of you are shocked that it's actually cold? <laughs> cold for us. Cold for us. Um, we don't always have winters where it actually gets down where we can wear sweaters. Um, so we've had sort of a 
uh, unusual cold snap in this beginning part. Um, I did something entirely un-Brazilian this weekend. I went to go see the DreamWorks exhibit and the Banco de Brasil because um, I have a 12-year-old son and so we had to go look at all of the... Yeah. But it was very good. So, what is it that Brazilian society looks like? And what I'm going to try and talk about this morning is a little bit of when we talk about, because when I was given the task, oh, you're going to give a lecture about Brazilian society, I said, oh my goodness, where do I start? Because there's so many things that I could touch upon. And so I decided to start with the basics, which is what is the demographic profile of Brazil? So what does the Brazilian population look like? And then from there, we can talk about how these population characteristics influence the makeup of society. So what is the composition of age and sex in Brazil? And what we have here is a little hard to see, but what we have is what's called a population pyramid. And so the bottom of the pyramid, oh, I have a little guy. The bottom of this pyramid here, so first of all, the, the men are green and the women are yellow. And so the bottom of the period are the younger people, and then the top of the pyramid are the older people. And so you can see that Brazil, and this is data from 2010, is still a relatively young population. So we have a majority of people that are in the range of 44 to 13, to 15, 14. Um, however, one of the things that's been happening in the past 10 to 20 years is a transition which has been happening all over the world, which is our population is getting older and older. And so when we look at Brazil, we can see how it's changed over time. So this is 1975, and in 1975, it really was a triangle, so you had a huge amount of young people. And then, this is 2000, and then here are the projections for 2025 and 2050. And so what do we expect from Brazilian society? We expect that Brazilian society is going to have the same patterns in the next 10 to 15 to 30 years that we've seen among European countries and we're seeing in Asian countries and we're seeing in Canada and the United States, which is a aging of the population. So here we have the total and then we have a breakdown by those that live in urban areas and those that live in rural areas of how people have been aging. So what percentage of the population is of a certain age, is above 60 years old. And so we're seeing that our aging population is growing and it's growing much more in urban areas than it is in rural areas. So what do we do with this information? And when we have statistics like this, we want to understand why. And there are some very interesting trends, if we look from 1960 until where we are now, in Brazil, that explain a little bit why our population is getting older and why that trend is happening more in the cities than it's happening in the countryside. So, we talk really about two major demographic transitions in Brazil. The first demographic transition is a distinct lowering of both infant mortality rates, 
and a lowering of fertility rates. So what happened? From the 1970s on, we had a definite decline in the number of babies and very young children who were dying, and we also had a decline in the number of children that each woman was having. So, as you can see, we've gone down. In 1960, the average number of children that each woman was having was 6.3 children. For example, my son's father, my son's father was born in 1976, and he is the second youngest of a family of seven children. Nowadays, if we look at 2015, the average rate or the average, age, the average number of babies that each woman is having is 1.7. So why did this happen? And that's one of the things that we look at as to what happened. Well, if you look at from 1960 to 1980, you had a couple things happening that influenced child mortality. Primarily, there was increased access to health care. There was more urbanization. People that live in rural areas had less access to prenatal care and health care, and you had significant amounts of the population, as we'll see in a minute, moving from rural areas to the cities in search of work. And so you have a definite decline in the number of young children and babies who are dying shortly after birth. But then we have an entire process, and we're going to talk about this a little bit when we talk about education levels, of women getting more education. And we know all over the world that the more time that a woman spends in school influences two things. First of all, that she's going to have her first child later. And because, unlike men, we have a very limited window of when women can have children, if you start late, you have fewer children overall. And so education levels and the amount of education that women have access to is going to have an extreme effect on fertility levels. However, in Brazil, we have another element that was very interesting. There was a very strong public health initiative to not only increase birth control access, but also to increase access to sterilization for women in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And it's the combination of all of these factors that led to a very steep decline in the number of babies that women were having in Brazil. And some of this public policy was highly criticized because part of the argument was that women were not given all of the information at the time in which they opted for a sterilization procedure. And that the sterilization procedure was presented to poorer women and women who already had many children. And so there's some discussion in the literature about to what extent these public policy, and especially these health policies, really were um, fully beneficial. They were beneficial to the society as a whole in terms of reducing our birth rate. However, there is a discussion about at what cost. You know, to what extent were very poor women placed in a position where they opted for a procedure that they couldn't change before they really knew what the whole implications of this procedure were. Because many times the sterilization procedures would happen as the woman was giving birth. So if the woman were giving birth by cesarean section and they were already there, they would just go ahead and take care of things. 
and there was some argument and some discussion whether or not every woman that was opting for these procedures actually had full idea of what they meant. So, that's one part of the equation. The Brazilian society is getting older because we're having, we're putting fewer young people into the system. So if you're having fewer children, then that means that more people are going to, you're going to give more opportunity for people to age. However, that's only one side. Because if there's not adequate health services and adequate sanitation and adequate um, urbanization in order for people to live full lives, they're still going to die very young. And so, for example, I'm sure in your Western civilization classes, you look at exactly what was the impact of industrialization and how industrialization increased the life expectancy of people because all of a sudden now we had sanitation, we had proper plumbing, and people were dying much later in life. Well, the same thing happened in Brazil. So we can't have an aging pyramid if we're only handling one side of the equation. So if the birth rate goes down, and in fact the birth rate in Brazil went down, we are not going to have an aging population if we still have a life expectancy that's very short. And as you can see, it's remarkable the change in life expectancy from 1960 to 1914. That's not a long time. That's 54 years. And in 54 years, you went from having an expectancy of only being 48, so this would be my last year on Earth, to a life expectancy of 75 Point four years. So why is that? Why did we have this huge jump in this time of only 54 years? Why do you all think? Any guesses? Mm-hmm. Health care. Mm-hmm. We had the institution of universal health care, which helped quite substantially. We also have transitions. When you have people working in economic sectors that are very physical and that have very poor conditions, that contributes to not living very long. When you have a transition economically, where fewer people are working in agriculture because more and more agriculture is influenced by technological advances, or you have fewer people that have to work in very dangerous conditions in mines because we have technological advances, or you have greater demand for people to work in a service sector, working in commerce, that means that people are actually going to be working in jobs that are less taxing physically. So on top of the fact that people had greater access to health care, you also have economic shifts. And these are things that are not only happening in Brazil. We've obviously seen life expectancy go up in a number of countries. But Definitely access to health care and the universal health care system here in Brazil, with all of its critiques, has made it so that people can um, not die of communicable diseases in the way that they did 40, 50 years ago and have greater life expectancy. This is a graph that shows you how many children people were having and at what age they stopped having children, they started having, at what age they stopped having children. What is the average age of having children for women in Brazil? So it begins in, in 1893 and it goes all the way up to 2010. 
And so you can see that in 1893, you had women, on average, had eight children. And then we get down to 2010, and women, on average, are having between two and three children. And the new data is showing that our average of, of how many children women have is less than two. The second graph that only begins in 1993 shows what is the average age, what is the average childbearing age. So how long are you having children? And you can see that that's gone remarkably down as well from between 30 and 31 years old. And now people are ending, you know, they're beginning their average age at which they have they stop having children is between 27 and 28. I talked a little bit about how our population pyramid is impacted by changes in where people live. And so I showed you that our mortality rates are linked up. We have difference between what are the conditions that people have when they live in rural areas and what are the conditions that they have when they live in the cities. One of the interesting things about Brazil is how quickly the population went from being majority rural, majority living in the countryside, to majority urban. And this happened really in a span of about 50 years. In the second half of the 20th century, Brazil began a very ambitious program for industrialization. And the industries were all in the south and southeast. And that spurred a lot of migration from the rural areas down to the south and southeast and into the cities. So up until about 1970, you have people living primarily on the coast, but there wasn't a greater concentration in cities than there was in rural areas. You didn't have the huge metropolitan areas of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro in the way that you have them today. From 1970 to 1990, what happens is with the push to industrialize and this industrialization taking place primarily in Sao Paulo, but also in Rio de Janeiro, you have a huge influx of people from the countryside coming into those two particular cities. What's been happening in the 21st century is the increase in the population of medium-sized cities. And so you'll see, for example, people leaving the city of Sao Paulo and moving to smaller cities like Campinas, which are more inland. And you see this also in Minas. You'll see that even though Belo Horizonte and the metropolitan region of Belo Horizonte is still the largest area population-wise in our state, we do have quite a bit of population and a growing population in medium-sized cities like Governador Valadares and Uberlândia. So we have different migration patterns that have sort of shaped the landscape of what it's like to live in Brazil. So this shows quite strikingly what happened in terms of the urbanization of Brazil. And this even begins in 1980 when 70% of the population already lived in the cities and a little more than 30% lived in the countryside. By 2010, you have less than 20% living in the countryside and closer to 80, 85% living in the cities. So this urbanization project continues. So we went from 1940, 1950, from being a country that was about 70% rural to now 
in this decade, being a country that is almost 90% urban. And where are these urban centers? So, we talk a lot about Brazil as a country, but one of the things that's very important to keep in mind are the regional differences. And I'm sure, have you all had your history? Which, histories, which lectures have you had? You had history yet? You had culture yet? So, in your history lecture and your culture lecture, I'm sure it became very evident that the regions of Brazil have their own particularities and make, bring their own contributions. And we're having a little bit of a political um, um, discussion uh, which happened about middle of last week because unfortunately um, <clears throat> the president said some things about the Northeast which reflect some of the stereotypes and prejudices that exist um, when we compare one region to the other. So these are the different regions of Brazil. Does anyone know what region we are in? Uh-huh, the southeast, okay? And so the southeast is the light blue, so it's going to have Minas Gerais, São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Espírito Santo, okay? The south is the pink one. It's going to have Paraná, Santa Catarina, and Rio Grande do Sul. The northeast is the orange. The green, which is the largest region, is the north region. And the center west is where you have Mato Grosso, Goiás, which is where Brasília, the Distrito Federal is, and Mato Grosso do Sul. What's interesting is that when we talk about migration patterns, when I was talking about migration patterns up to 1970, you had principally people living always along the coast. Yeah. One of the reasons why they decided to stick Brasilia right here was because there was a long project, a long historical project of let's get people moving into the center of the country. Let's try and use all of this great space that Brazil has. And so that was part of the reason why they decided, you know, Brazil was not an organic decision, it was a political decision. Let's centralize our population and bring people in. And they had to bring in all the building materials by helicopter and plane because they didn't even have roads built to get to where they wanted to build the city in the very beginning. But when we're talking about the migration patterns from 1970, you know, 60s, 70s on, up until about um, the 80s and 90s, we're talking about huge migrations that come from here um, and that are moving into Sao Paulo, principally Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro. There's a huge migration of Minas Gerais into Sao Paulo and Rio. I don't know whether you've noticed, now that you went all out in town and began to do some social things, I don't know whether you notice it's balancing out a little bit more now. But for a very long time, Minas was a wonderful place to be a young man and not such a great place to be a young woman. Does anyone know why? When you were all out socializing at the thing, did you see more young women or more young men? Huh? Now you see more young men. But Minas had very high migration rates, and we'll look a little bit at those migration rates. And at one point, they said that there were seven women here in this city for every man. And so in terms of the dating pool, it was very good to be a young man here in Minas because most of your competition had moved out looking for work. However, on the other hand, to be a young woman in the dating pool here was pretty depressing. So when I first moved here in 2003, everyone said, oh, it's terrible, it's a good thing you're already married because it's terrible, the dating here in Minas is just awful. Um, exactly for those reasons. So you had People moving from the north, people moving from the northeast, people moving even from Minas Gerais, moving into Sao Paulo and Rio where the large poles 
industrial poles were. What's happened since then is that you have some migration coming into the north now because of different agricultural projects, and you have people moving into medium-sized cities in the past 10 or 20 years. And so this is the distribution by region. It's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see that this is the southeast, which is the larger piece here, and this is the northeast. And so you can see over time how it's going slightly down, the amount of people that are in the southeast, but that it's the larger draw. And so here's the northeast, and you can see how it got smaller and smaller as more people were leaving the northeast and the north here. See, and how you can see in the 90s, 2000s, how there's a slight increase of people moving back into the north region. And you have slightly fewer people that are in the southeast. Here's another way that we can look at it. So these are the growth rates. This is how much each region grew. So from 60 to 1970, what happens? You have stronger growth rates in the south and the southeast, and you have a huge growth rate in the center east. Does anyone know why in the center west? Does anyone know why in the 60s and 70s it has that huge growth rate? Do anyone, does anyone know what year Brasilia was founded? Not even my Brazilians know. 1963. So, hmm, it makes sense that in 1960, 1970, if you build the capital of the country, you know, if you build it, they will come. So you have this huge growth. And you can see here how the growth rate of the southeast, which was always very large, is going down. And how now we're having a larger growth rate here in the north. This shows you who's coming and who's going. So what states are losing people over time and what states are gaining people. So everything on top are positive gains and everything on the bottom are losses. So if you look at This first one right here is 1960. So this is the north. The north is always gaining people all through, from 60, 70, 80, 90, and 2000, 2010. The northeast always had migration flowing out of that region. And the southeast always had people coming in. But look at little Minas Gerais over here. This is what I kept telling you. Look at that huge line all the people leaving in 1960 and 1970. And they were going to Sao Paulo and they were going to Rio de Janeiro. And so you have people coming into the south in the beginning and leaving. In the very beginning in Paraná, which is also part of the south, you see how there was large increases and then leaving. And then the center west, like the north, has always had positive migrations. And so we get to see a little bit, Minas Gerais has consistently had, in almost all of it, pe more people leaving than coming. And in the 60s and the 70s, for example, most of those people that were leaving were men. And so that's where this idea, you know, this lore of how hard it was to be a young woman in Minas, because all the men were gone, came to be. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of how many people Brazil has. Does anyone know what the current population numbers are of Brazil? I didn't even mention that. Hmm? Not quite that much. <laughs> We're about 210 million 
people. So we have an idea of what the composition looks like. So how old are the people? Where do they live? Where have they moved around to? And now we'll get a little bit of a sense of who these people are. There are three main ethnic groups in Brazil. So we have Europeans, and the Europeans are not just the Portuguese. We had French settlers, Dutch settlers, Germans, Italians, and Spanish coming in. Those are the larger groups. And then the other primary ethnic group are African descendants. Rio de Janeiro as a slave port received more slaves than any other slave port in the Western Hemisphere at the height of the slave trade. So Brazil had more slaves than the United States, many more. Most of the African descendants coming into Brazil came from Portuguese colonies in Africa, so primarily Mozambique and Angola. And then indigenous peoples. Brazil has an incredibly rich mosaic of indigenous peoples. There are over 305 different ethnic groups and we have more than 270 indigenous languages that these groups speak in Brazil. So those are the three main components when we think about, you know, what is the descendancy or what is the ethnic composition of Brazil. How that gets measured and how that gets represented across time becomes a very interesting sociological puzzle to solve. We have other ethnic groups that have migrated to Brazil in the 20th century. We had a very large Japanese migration, which primarily took place between 1908 and 1960. We have Arabic migration, especially from Lebanon, but also from Syria, and before the Syrian refugee crisis. So these were prior to, and now we're receiving others from there. We have Chinese migration, Korean migration, and most recently and continually we've had other Central or other South American migration, quite a bit of Peruvian and Bolivian migration. And during the Haitian crisis, there was quite a bit of Haitian migration through refugee status. And then you have your random North American, Canadian, those of us that sneak in as well. So Brazil is pretty ethnically diverse. One of the things that makes Brazil very interesting to study is exactly how this large population of African descendants has lived and integrated or not integrated and become part of the fabric in Brazil. And so one of the things that's been very interesting all through the history of Brazil is how are each of these primary ethnic components measured and how that measuring has implications for the social hierarchy or the social composition of the country. And so one of the things that's incredibly fascinating to study in Brazil is exactly what is race in Brazil, how do we measure it, and then how do we study any possible impact that different racial categorization could have on day-to-day -day life. So is racial categorization linked to 
educational attainment? Is it linked to um, income? Is it linked to health outcomes? Is it linked to social control issues? Is it linked to crime? Is it linked to fear? Is it linked to um, a number of different elements of society? And so it's always been interesting. It's always been interesting not only to examine what racial classification and how race is classified and understand how people that are ra different racial categories have perhaps different income outcomes, but also to sort of take a step back and think about, well, how was race really classified in Brazil? Because it's a very messy story. So, typically, we look at the census to give us a sense of who is in Brazil and what are their characteristics. And so, we have a decennial census in Brazil, like many countries do, and it began in 1872. And from then, we began asking this question. So, we asked in 1872, now and you have to remember in 1872, slavery still existed in Brazil. Slavery did not go away in Brazil until 1888. It was the last one. So, how was race first looked at? First it was looked at, so their categories were white, black, mestiza, which would be some combination, cabocla, which was a free black person, and black was considered the slave population. Then we pass a very long time where we didn't ask about race in the census. Yeah. And I'll talk a little bit about this in how there was a discussion that because there was more, mis there was more racial mixing, misinization in Brazil, we couldn't really say there was actually race in Brazil. And because of that, we had a racial democracy. And if we have a racial democracy and everybody's a little bit of everything, then it doesn't make any sense to ask about race in Brazil. And so for a long time in the census, they didn't even ask about it. They didn't ask, what's your race? And in 1940, we came back to this question and we started asking. And one of the interesting things when you look at how is race measured in Brazil? How is it even asked by the government? So how is it asked on the census? How do we ask people, what is your race? We don't say, what is your race? We say, what is your color? Which is very different than if you look at, for example, how they ask about race and ethnicity. And ethnicity isn't even asked. And if you look at, if you compare, for example, the questions on our census in Brazil, and you compare it to, say, maybe the US census, where you've got all of these categories, you've got, you know, uh, white, non-Hispanic, and you've got, and then you have all of these huge categories for ethnicity as well. The question that we use is, what is your race or color? And that's how we get this strange category, yellow. What in the world is yellow? Does anyone have any idea what yellow could possibly be measuring? What in the world? What, is it, what does it mean to be yellow? My color is yellow. What in the world could that possibly be? Anyone have any idea? Yes. People in Brazil that are of Asian or Asiatic descent. Wait a minute, but Asian, is that ethnicity or is that race? So we have this really strange idea that the color is yellow, which is, you know, um, in any other country in the world, that would be incredibly offensive. If you tried to ask, you know, an Asian American in the United States, oh, are you yellow? That would be incredibly offensive. But that is the category. That is the name of the category, amarelo, yellow. So in 1940, they devised white, black, and not negro black, 
Preto, like the crayon color, preto. Again, color. So white, black, and yellow. And so then you had to try and make up your mind, you know, am I black or am I white? And then that begins with this issue because unlike in the United States, if we're looking at it in color, in the United States a person identifies themselves as African American if they have what's called the one drop rule. So if somewhere, anywhere in your family somebody was African American, then you're African American, regardless of your, the, the tone of your skin. In Brazil, it's all about the tone of your skin. So in 1960, they decided that they were going to try and include this middle category for this different tone. So someone that's not black, someone that's not white. Well, if you mix the colors, white and black together, you know, technically you get gray, but they said you get brown. So again, the word in Portuguese is a color like you would find on a crayon box. So you have branco, preto, pardo, and amarelo. You have black, black br white, black, brown, and yellow. Okay? And those were the categories for a very long time. And in the 1991 census, well, wait a minute, aren't the census every 10 years? Anyone know why the census for 1990 is not 1990, it's 1991? Anyone have any idea? It's kind of a fun um, data fact. In 1990, we had a president who was later impeached um, who decided that it was unnecessary to do the census, and he just canceled it. And there was a big uproar, and they said, no, 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 you can't do that. And so they had the census in 1991. So now we have a president who says, oh, it's too expensive to do the census. Let's just cut like 20% of the questions. We don't need all these questions. It's ridiculous. Um, so Brazil's been here before. Um, and the very first time I ever came to Brazil was in 1992. So a lot of the things that are happening, I almost feel like I went back in time because it feels to me very much like we're going through a, a period where people don't really, um, we have leaders that aren't making a lot of sense. So we have a census in 1991 instead of 1990. And in that census, they brought back this category of indigenous because they said, well, we need to know this. And Brazil doesn't have in the census a separate question for ethnicity. So it doesn't ask you, are you of German descent? Although they could, because there are a lot of people who came. They don't ask you if in your yellowness, are you Korean, are you Chinese, are you Japanese, are you Vietnamese? They don't ask any of those questions. So they wanted to find out what's the quantity of indigenous people that are in Brazil. And so they put it into this question. And so now we have this really strange question, because indigenous, that's not a race, that's an ethnicity. So now we have this question that has these colors, which are kind of strange, and this category of indigenous people. So that's what it's been ever since 1990. And nobody likes it. Everyone who studies race says these categories are not good enough. The problem is, is that nobody has decided what categories would work better. And we've had a lot of research trying to figure out what would it mean to use different categories. At one point, we have a survey that's sent out to the Brazilian population. It's called the, um, it's the National Sample household sample survey of the population and it's done every single year that there's not a census and there was one year when they said no let's really try and work on getting these categories to be a little bit better because we don't like these categories these categories are really not indicative of what the um, population is you know people don't call themselves yellow you know people don't call themselves preto Usually people, if they identify 
as darker skin, they'll say that I'm negro. So let's, let's try and figure out how people call themselves. And so this survey had an open question that said, what color or race are you? Blank. There were over 250 different answers. People called themselves coal black, they called themselves honey, they called themselves moreno, they called themselves moreno claro. There were all kinds of different words that people used to describe themselves. And some of those words we tried to put in and compare with different surveys. So for example, there was some work that was done to see whether we could substitute the word brown for the word moreno, which is what people call themselves. Well, what happened? We found that there were a lot more people that liked the word moreno than brown, and so we had people who previously said they were white become moreno, people who had previously said they were black become moreno, and so it was very hard to get a sense if there were any boundaries really where moreno was. It also depended on what time of the year we asked the question. Why would that matter? Why would that matter? You had to answer. Why would that matter? Exactly. And in fact, if you go to the beach and you come back, and you come back more tan, people say, ah, você está bem moreno agora. Even me, who has a very hard time getting tan, if I come back and I have like a teeny bit of tan, they'll be like, oh, you're more moreno. So even the word moreno, it has this connotation of getting a tan. So there were problems with that word. Then we had a bunch of research trying to look at, well, okay, let's work on a word that maybe is a little bit easier to define. Let's not use the word preto. People don't say preto. People don't self-identify. Oh, I'm preto. They say, because preto is a, is a crayon color. I mean, that's, preto is like the color of your car. That's not the color of your skin. And they said, well, why don't we use negro? And so there's been some research, and they did some questions and asking people about that. And negro has a bunch of different connotations socially as well. And they found that there was actually a split. There was an age split and there was an education split. So older people in general didn't have a problem with identifying as negro, but younger people did. However, those people who had more schooling would identify more as negro than people who had less schooling. So even if you were young, if you had more, a higher education level, and especially if you had a university education level, you would identify more as negro than preto. The other part of the equation is that we want to know the composition, the racial and ethnic composition for two reasons. We're interested in understanding how people identify themselves. So I want to know what makes you consider yourself preto or amarelo or pardo. But the other thing that we want to know is how do other people identify? So I may think that I'm white, but some would be like, nah, you're not white. Well, in my case, it'd be kind of hard. But if you took someone who was more, like, say I was really tan, they'd be like, no, you're not white. You're pardo. And maybe that designation of what other people see me as is going to affect social relations among society. And so one of the things we want to know is how do people identify themselves? But the other thing that was always really important is how are you seen? And when we're trying to understand how racial classification could have an impact on social outcomes, how you are seen 
is a lot more important than how you identify. And so we haven't really come up with a very good measure or a very good way to figure out how people are seen in terms of, oh, this is how I identify this person. But that is exactly the issue because when we're looking at who gets the job, who gets into university, who goes into certain social spaces, it's how you are seen that makes the difference. And so we don't have this really rich census data on how people see other people. But when we start looking at our information, for example, do certain racial categories have different outcomes? So for example, is there a difference in income levels between people who, on the census, say they are black versus people who, on the census, say they are white. And then we try and figure out, well, why is that? And so a lot of our research has to do with how you are seen and not how you identify. Just a quick question. When do you all usually take your break, around 10.30? Do you take a break or do you just go straight through? Huh? Okay. And those that power through, are they good lecturers or are they bad lecturers? <laughs> I'll give us a teeny bathroom break in about 15 minutes, okay? For about five minutes. Is that all right? Um, because it's early in the morning, we all had breakfast, and I don't know about you, but... Usually, I can't go three hours after I've just had a big breakfast. Or even a little breakfast. So this is the current um, racial composition. And the blue is 2002 data. And the orange is 2010 data. And this is census data. So you can see that in 2000, 62.7% of the population identified as white. Six point two identified as black. Zero point five identified as yellow. Thirty eight point five identified as brown. And then point four percent identified as indigenous. And then we had people who didn't give information. They said no, I have an idea, I'm not gonna answer that question. What do we see a little bit in 2010? We see a decrease in the amount of people who identify as white on the census, a slight increase of people who identify as black, and a slight increase from 38 to 43% of people who identify as brown. Why is that? Did we have a ethnic shift from 2000 to 2010, do you think? What do you all think? Is this, is this, is, does this change indicate a change in the absolute number of people in those categories, or does this reflect a change in how people report themselves? What do you think? The second one. The truth is it's probably a little bit of both. Because we know, for example, that birth rates are lower among people who identify as white as people who identify as black. But we also have something that's happened from 2000 to 2010 that could mean that adults um, are rethinking their racial classification. Does anyone know? It particularly affects the university system. Exactly. We had a quota system that was put into place, and that allowed for a, um, a different, so now what we have is we have different competing pools. So if you identify as black or brown, 
you are in a different pool of selection than those that do not. And the reason for this was the argument that the university system is publicly funded and it had to increase opportunities for those that primarily came from public schools. And so the racial quota is actually mixed with an income quota. And that's one of the things that's very interesting when we study race in Brazil, is that race and class in Brazil are always very tightly intertwined. And so it has been very hard for us to actually see whether these outcomes that are different between racial groups are different because of class differences, so income and socioeconomic differences, or whether they're actually race differences. And that has been a very difficult thing for us as sociologists to try to untangle. But probably we have a little bit of both here. We have differences in absolute numbers, but we probably have differences in reporting. We probably have people who said no, you know, Perhaps people that were in the brown category said, no, I'm not brown, I'm black. Or people that originally were in the white category say, no, you know what, I really feel that I'm more brown than white. It's very difficult for us to really know. What we can do is we can compare those percentages, differences, with differences in the amount of people being born and the amount of people dying over those 10 years and get a sense of how much of this is a reporting difference and how much of this is a difference in absolute numbers. But what we are seeing is an increase in diversity. For example, our city, Belo Horizonte, is a city where the brown population and the black population together are more than the white population. So we live in a majority non-white city. This is the racial distribution by region. So this sort of purpley color is white. This sort of lilac color is black. And this light blue is pardu. And then the indigenous is this teeny tiny little green place here. And then the yellow, you can barely, 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 barely see it. You can see it a little bit more over here. It's right next to the green but it's a very, very small amount. And so what do we have here? Oh wait, okay, this is the yellow and that's the, that's the indigenous. We don't have indigenous in this. We have a teeny bit here in the central and we have a teeny bit here in the northeast. Or in the, oh that's funny. These are wrong. This is the northeast and this is the north. So if you look at Brazil as a whole, the white population is slightly more, is larger. If you look at the Northeast, you have a much larger brown population and a larger piece of the black population. If you look at the North, it's the only place where we actually have substantial indigenous population and the white population is the lowest in the north. In the south, by contrast, we have a very high white population, low pe population that identify as brown, and very low population that identify as black. And then here's the southeast, and the southeast is gonna have a slightly higher white population than Brazil as a total, and a slightly higher black population, but a smaller brown population and then the center is going to look um, a little bit more like the north, I mean the northeast. Does anyone know why we have different racial compositions for the different regions in Brazil? Now you guys should know this because you had the history lecture. Yes. Why is there a higher brown Remember that this second one is the Northeast. They labeled it wrong. Uh, why is this so different from this? Why are there more, why is the highest level of black population in the Northeast and nowhere else? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, well what about colonization? 
Originally, there were more blacks in the Northeast. Do you know why? What were the blacks doing in Brazil? What were the slaves doing? What were they occupied doing in Brazil? Sugarcane. And where was the sugarcane? Here. So even though there were slaves in the south and the southeast because of the gold extraction, the huge amount of slaves that came over during the large slave trade went to work in the sugar plantations. And most of the sugar plantations were in the Northeast. So you had the highest levels of black population and then you had the highest levels of mixing. So that's why in the Northeast you have a much higher brown population. In the South, in addition to the colonization of the original Portuguese, the South is where you had the large migrations of Germans and the large migrations of Italians. Everyone who came to Ellis Island, all the Italians in the huge wave of Italian migration uh, that tried to come into New York City and couldn't get to New York City, they went to Sao Paulo and Buenos Aires. So we had a large influx of Italians that came in in the very beginning of the 20th century. The German migration happened before World War II. Yes, there were Nazis that fled to Brazil, but the large amount of Brazilian migra or German migration actually came in the mid-1800s, um, conjointly with the large German migrations that came to the Northern Hemisphere. So the South has traditionally had Slovenians, Russians, Bavarians, Pomeranians, Germans, and Italians. So we have a very different racial distribution. And it's part of that racial distribution that has led to some very unfortunate stereotypes and prejudices between particularly the South and the Southeast in regards to the Northeast. And so if any of you were following the news last week, um, the president had a news conference, a breakfast news conference with international journalists, and he made a comment. He said, oh, those Paraíba states. Paraíba is a state of the Northeast, but it's also used as a pejorative slang to refer to anyone who comes from the Northeast. And so there was a big uproar about that. And as you'll see, you've, have you had the uh, politics lecture yet? As you'll see with the politics lecture, if you look at the map of the voting in the last election, you had a huge, almost all of the Northeast, almost every state in the Northeast and the North, um, the majority of the people in those states voted for the candidate that lost. And if you look at the South and the Southeast, almost all the states in the South and the Southeast voted for the candidate who won the election. So there are some distinctions politically and then there's also some distinctions that have a bit of racial bias to them. Um, so the racial distribution of the country is very interesting to look at because that sort of sheds some light on some of the uh, culture and some of the um, language that's used to describe each area. You all are very quiet about questions. Any questions so far? No? No? So, we've talked a lot about composition, and so we know what are the age of the population, we know where the population lives, we know the migration patterns, and we've looked at the different race and ethnic compositions of the population. So one other characteristic that we're going to look at is religion. And in the census, the Brazilian census, we have the following categories. So they ask if you're Catholic. They ask if you're evangelical. 
And in the evangelical, they separate that into traditional and Pentecostal. They ask if you are a spirita. They ask if you are an adherent, if you're a member of any of the African religions. And they ask you if you are any other religion. And then they ask you, well, if you don't have any religion. And so those are the categories that we have for religion. Um, which was really interesting for me, beginning to look at that, because if you compare it to other census, you know, the United States census, um, Protestant is broken down into like 15 different categories. Um, and here, what they're considering Protestant, they're not even calling Protestant, they're calling evangelical. And so traditional evangelical is going to be Baptist, Methodist, and then Pentecostal are going to be what a lot of people in the United States, when they think about religion, think about evangelical religion. So, um, um, Universal Church of God, Assembly of God, and these others. And then, of course, we don't really have a category for Espirita or for African. And one of the interesting things, and this is a Latin American phenomenon, not just a Brazilian phenomenon, but since Brazil is the largest country in Latin America, Brazil has the strongest, you, you can see this pattern most strikingly in Brazil, is how a country has gone from being almost entirely Catholic to increasingly having a larger and larger share of evangelicals or Protestants. So, this is a graph that shows that a little bit. So, this is the distribution of the population according to their declared religions. And here we have Catholic, Spiritist, Protestant, or Evangelical together, any other religion, and someone without religion. And so this line is the Catholic line. And so you can see in 1960, you have over 90% of the population saying, I'm Catholic. And then it goes, Nye. In 2010, it hits about 60%. And then you have this line here, which is the Protestant evangelicals. And so here, in 1960, you had less than 10% of the population that said that this is what they were. And it's gone all the way up, and it's hitting, getting close to hitting, about 30% now. The other interesting line is this no religion line. And this no religion line has gone up. And now it's about 5%. So people who study religion um, in Latin America have said that this is sort of a Protestant revolution that happened in Latin America, and it's really very recent. And a lot of scholars attribute the rise of Protestant religions and the decline of the Catholic Church in the fact that Protestant religions were attending to demands and needs of a whole sector of the population that the Catholic Church was not attending to. And so, for example, if you look at the case in Brazil, in Brazil, the large majority of people who say that they're part of an evangelical church or a Protestant church are of, um, have less socioeconomic status than those who say they're Catholic or Espirita. And the argument was that you had two movements happening in the 1970s. You had liberation theology, which was Catholic drawn, um, that was trying to introduce social justice into the Catholic dogma. And then you had evangelical churches, which were prophetizing specifically to the poor. And because the Protestant religions argue that you don't need an intermediary, that you can learn and get your spirituality directly from the Bible. It spurred, uh, it was necessary for people to learn to read, and so it pushed uh, literacy rates, and it became, and it 
responded, and people of so lower socioeconomic statuses responded more to this religion, and they found in it, it attended their demands a lot more for their spirituality and how they wanted to conduct their spirituality in a way that the Catholic Church was not doing at the time. And that has grown. And so it's been a very interesting trend to see that Catholicism, which once was almost everyone's religion here in Brazil, has really gone down. And now a lot of times when we ask in surveys, we'll ask, well, are you a Catholic or are you, are you practicing or a non-practicing Catholic? Because there are people who are culturally Catholic. You know, I was born, my family's Catholic, they baptized me, they dragged me to church, I did First Communion, but as soon as I could get out of it, I got out of it. But I still go, you know, on Easter and, you know, on Eve, Good Friday, I don't eat meat, I eat fish, and I do things that follow some of the Catholic teachings, but I don't really go to church. And so that would be sort of a non-practicing Catholic, this idea that culturally you're Catholic. You know, what we call in the United States, we have the same term. We call them C&E Protestants. So they go to church on Christmas and Easter. And then they don't go to church any other time. And we actually did, when we did a survey of the city and the metropolitan region, we asked people about their frequency. How often do you go to church? And we actually included a category of, I only go to church for weddings and baptisms and funerals. So, and a lot of people just marked that. So that's one of the changes that's happening. And here, this is a little hard to read, but I'll help you out with it. This is census data. And so here's 1960. And in 1960, if you looked at, you had 65,000, a little over 65,000 people said that they were Catholic. And the huge majority of these were Roman Catholics. And then you had a tiny bit that were um, Orthodox Catholics, and you had about two million people who were evangelicals. And then they only asked, are you evangelical? They didn't ask any of these other categories. And then in 1960 here, they didn't ask any of these categories. They asked Spirita, so you had less than a million. And then they asked other religions, and the other religions, people could say what religion they were. So you had uh, about 96,000 people that identified as Jewish, about 7,000 who identified as Islam, about Islamic, uh, about 180,000 that were Buddhist, and then about 340 who said they were other religions. And then here you had about 3,000, uh, about 30, almost 400,000 who said they didn't have religion. So you had a total of about 70,000. So of the 70,000, You had 65, or of the 70 million who answered the census in 1960, you had 65 million say, I'm Catholic. When you get to 2010, which is over here, you have total about 190 million people answering the census here, of which only 123 million of them say that they're Catholic. So you still have a really high rate of people who are Catholic, but it's definitely going down. And now you can see how they've added in different categories. So they still call everybody evangelical, and then in that they have what they consider traditional Protestant religions, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Adventist, and other um, traditional Protestant religions. So that would be like Anglican. Um, and then the Pentecostals, which would be Assembly of God, Congregation of Christ in Brazil, Brazil for Christ, Quadrangular Church, Universal Church of God, God is Love, and other Pentecostals. And then they've opened up what they would consider spirita or medianic religions. And they've put Umbanda, and then they've put Afro, so Kardisha, and Afro-Brazilian, which they would do Umbanda and Candomblé. And then you see that we have actually more categories now. So we have a much more religiously diverse population in 2010 than we ever did in 2060. So we really have had a diversification 
of Brazilian religions over time, of people who have different religious identities over time. So I'm going to give us about a five-minute break before I go into this slide because otherwise I think it'll go too long. So uh, my, my clock says 1021, so let's try and get back here by 1030. Is that good? So I talked a little bit about why evangelical religions, um, you have a very strong urban and rural division, so uh, you see much more increase of people saying that they are part of evangelical or Protestant religions in urban areas versus rural areas. There's an economic bias, which I spoke about. You see that there are... that. A large majority of the people who identify and say that they're part of evangelical churches have lower socioeconomic status. And you see a very distinct rise in Pentecostalism in the 1980s and the 1990s, primarily because of the, uh, the approach of evangelical religions and the fact that they seem to... Um, attend to the demands of populations more than the Catholic Church was doing. In the 1980s and the 1990s, Brazil was in a situation of economic distress. The 1980s in Latin America are known, is known pretty collectively as the lost decade. Um, a lot of the um, Economic development in Latin America was financed through loans acquired in the 1970s. Uh, these loans had very, very low interest rates because of the oil crisis and the oil embargo that happened. So Arab countries had a lot of money. They put money in banks. Banks were very open to lending. In the 1980s, those interest rates went way up. And many countries in Latin America had a very hard time paying off these loans. Um, and ended up using a lot of their GDP for the interest and for the loans and could not continue with the development. And that was the case as well in Brazil. In Brazil in the 1980s, you had hyperinflation. You guys had your economic lecture yet? You had your economics lecture, yes? So you know about the uh, inflation. Um, I caught a teeny bit of that inflation in 1992 and 1993. Um, it was pretty crazy. I'd never lived through anything like that. Um, and the message of the Pentecostal church um, and its, its spiritual organization really made much more sense to. It seemed to be paying more attention to these people, to people who were of lower economic status than people that the Catholic church was trying to reach. And so... Um, a lot of scholars attribute the rise of Pentecostalism in Latin America, and specifically in Brazil, to some of this economic bias. Now, what I want to focus on in the rest of my lecture is something that I've sort of alluded to when we talked about race, which was what are the consequences or what are the outcomes of this composition? And so one of the main characteristics of Brazilian society, when you look at the composition of the society, is that Brazil is a place with very high levels of social inequality. And we needed to understand a little bit about the racial composition, about the age composition, about the regional composition, before we could really talk about these inequalities. And so we are talking about a country that's very highly stratified with marked differences in development. And when I talk about development, I'm talking about primarily economic development, but these other compositional aspects, specifically race, 
are going to play in very strongly into this. So if we look at the Gini Index, and the Gini Index is an international indicator of inequality, so it compares the highest 20% with the lowest 20%. It does a little bit more than that, but in very simple terms, the Gini Index tries to measure income inequality in a country. In 2001, the Gini Index was 55.3. You want your Gini Index to go lower, because the lower that your index is, the less inequality you have. We were looking to do pretty well in 2014. We were going down. And in fact, if you look at the 1980s when our Gini index was up in 60, 61, we've been markedly going down. Now, we've had a small, yes? What you do is you ask people what is, in, in Brazil we measure income by what we call, what was, we, we say what is your monthly income. And usually the way that we measure it is we measure it by the amount of minimum income. So the minimum wage in Brazil has fluctuated over time. So currently the minimum wage is about 978, 980 reais per month. That's, huh? Yes, it's set by law. Um, it hasn't always been that. Um, back in 2000 and back in 1998, it was 112 reais a month. Um, and so a lot of times what we've done in order to be able to measure it is we say how many minimum, instead of asking how much you make a month and you give me a number, you put yourself on an interval scale. So you say, do you make less than a minimum salary a month? Do you make one minimum salary a month? Do you make one to two, one to three to five, more than five minimum salaries a month? And we use that scale. Um, what the Gini Index does is it takes information and it aggregates those that, the 20% of the population that say they make less than a minimum salary, and it compares it to the 20% of the population that has the highest salary. And it comes up with a ratio measure, it comes up with an index measure. It's not the only piece of information that's in the Gini index, but it's the primary piece. And so the idea is, is that if you have a big gap, so for example, um, Brazil has a huge income inequality. So I make about half every month than what a judge makes. But I still, if you take my salary and you compare it to everybody's salary in Brazil, I make more than 98% of the population. And, I'm, and, and I still only make half of what a judge makes. So what you have in Brazil is an income line where if this is zero and this is say 50,000, you have tons of people that are up here, close to zero, and you have a few people that are way out here, 30, 40, 50, and so you have this sort of long tail of an, an income. And so what it's trying to do is look at that. If you have good income inequality, then that means that there's not a lot of space between the richest and the poorest. And what they try to do with the Gini Index is come up with uh, standardized measures and say, so, for example, they'll take the way that each country measures income and they'll compare it to itself and then they'll use that as the Gini index. And so we'd had a inequality measure that was getting better. So our Gini index was going lower, but as you can see, from 2014 to 2017, it's gone up a little bit. So why, uh-huh. Yes, they ask income data during the census. Yes. Well, technically the census is everybody. 
so that's that the idea of a census is it's a universal count you want to know it from everybody that doesn't mean that there is not a non-response rate in the census there is a very small one but they work very very hard for there to be um, people counted in the census every year that I've been in Brazil regardless of my immigration status and I've been here during a census year I've been in the census I've been asked in the census Yes. In 2000, I was doing field work in a favela in Rio, and they knocked on my door, and they asked me questions in the census. In 2010, I was here in Belo Horizonte. I was in a house in Pampulha, and they knocked on my door, and they asked me questions in the census. Um, the data that they collect in between census years is a sample, and so they try and come up with a probabilistic sample that is representative of the whole country. Um, what they ask is income. And one of the things that's different, and maybe you all looked at it when you had your economic lecture, between what's called formal economy and informal economy. So whether you are on the books and getting all of your labor benefits, or whether you're working under the table. Um, but we've had a slight increase in our inequality rate. And that is currently a uh, result of the economic crisis that started in 2014. And so when you have higher levels of unemployment, because right now we're at 13, um, about around 13% unemployment in Brazil, um, then of course you're going to have a larger gap. And data has come out more recently that has shown that the economic crisis has been much harder felt by those on the bottom than those on the top, which is pretty self-explanatory. One of the problems of being a sociologist is we confirm things, everyone's like, oh, well, obviously, everybody already knows that. Um, but it's kind of nice to see it in the numbers as well, to really see what is it that's the difference. Um, and so this standing in terms of how it's ranking on most unequal country in the world, we're at 19 in the whole world. So. Brazil is not doing very well in terms of inequality. And on top of income inequality, I want to talk a little bit about these other compositional measures. So I'm going to talk about race and how racial inequality fits into this message. When we've talked about inequality, and social inequality has been one of the main issues are one of the central concerns in sociology and social science in Brazil. We're trying to understand, you know, what is the uh, composition of the country, how are the benefits and the goods distributed in this country. And so one of the main themes, one of the main problems that has always been part of Brazilian sociology or Brazilian social science is looking at inequality. And there's always been an interest to understand to what extent race and class influences this inequality. So remember I said that one of the things that's been difficult when we measure race and when we try to understand if racial categories have anything to do with outcomes is that there is a high correlation between being black and being poor in Brazil. And because of that, when we talk about inequality, so for example, does everybody get to go to school? Does everybody get to go to college? You know, who, is, uh, who are the doctors and the lawyers? You know, who are the garbage men and the doormen? When we try and talk about what are the different outcomes, there's always been this discussion about whether there is a race effect. Okay, so are people not going to school because they're being discriminated against because they're black? Or is it because of class? Is it because of income? And this, those two elements have always been very mixed up because we have a concentration of income by race. And so there have been discussions about how to deal with it and how to study inequality. And so in the 1930s, if Brazil is a racial democracy, 
and everybody has a little bit of everything, then if there's an equality, if some people aren't getting to go to school, and if other people aren't earning as much as they could, if there's no social mobility, for example, if I'm born and my father is a doorman, but I want to be a doctor, if that's not possible, it's not because my father, the doorman, is black and I'm black. It's because my father's a doorman and we're poor and we don't have opportunities because we're poor. So in the 1930s, the discussion was it's not race, it's class. We need to deal with income inequality and we need to focus on equal distribution across income. It's in the 1950s where we begin to look at, well, maybe it's not only class. So maybe there's racial discrimination. So if you have a situation where somebody doesn't have the income inequality, but is of a different racial category, if that person isn't getting ahead as much, then you can begin to say, well, maybe race has something to do with it. And so in the 1950s, we begin to have discussions that maybe there's racial inequality, but there's a lot of discussion and there's no consensus that we can really separate out race as a possibility for inequality versus class. It isn't until the 1970s where really we began to be able to say no. If I look at people with the same income, but they're different racial categories, people with different racial categories have different outcomes. So yes, if you know, income might have something to do with it, but if I control for income, or if I control for schooling, so let's say I want to compare whether people that identify as black make more or less money than people that identify as white. And you can say, oh, well, you know, people that are white in general have more schooling. And who has more schooling is always going to make more money. I can say, okay, well, fine. But if I control for that, if I find people that have the same schooling, is there still going to be a difference? And the studies in the 1970s begin to show this. They begin to show, no, wait a minute. It's not just class. So there was racial inequality. There's differences in outcomes. For example, white people had more schooling. They had lower mortality rates. They had better occupation in the labor market. And you couldn't just say, you couldn't just say that this was an effect of class. And these studies begin to get more and more sophisticated in the 1980s and the 1990s. And now we're really trying to understand racial discrimination. And so now we really see evidence that there is racial inequality. So now we see that there's unequal insertion into the labor market, and this cannot be attributed to only income. This cannot be a fact of only class. So we see differences in education, differences in the labor market, and these become more and more um, obvious that there are actual racial inequalities, that it's not just class. It's not just that black people don't do well because black people are poor. No, it's black people don't do well because there's racial discrimination against black people. And this is the seed for a lot of the affirmative action policies that follow in the 2000s are these studies that begin to disaggregate and say, no, there actually is something going on here. So this is a map of the metropolitan region of Belo Horizonte. So, even though we have studies that are trying to disaggregate race and class, it's very difficult because there is a very high correlation, okay? 
this is a map of the metropolitan region of Belo Horizonte by composition. And the red right here, so all these areas with red are the areas where there is a higher concentration of white people. And the areas that are blue are where there are, these are census tracts with less percentages of white people. So all of the blue census tracts have between 0 and 28% white people living in them. And all of the red areas have between 74 and 90% white people living in them. So you can see that Belo Horizonte, even though we have a majority non-white population, it's not all mixed up. We have some pockets of all white, and we have some pockets of no white. Okay. This map over here is per capita income for the metropolitan region in the same year. And the red is the highest per capita income. So that's 2,000 to 3,500. So per capita means that each person. So they usually ask household income and then they divide it by the number of people in the household. And the blue is 426 to 710. So you're looking at less than minimum wage. Does anyone see any similarities between these two maps? With the exception of this area of the city here, which is a predominantly white area, but it's not a high income area, if you look at the pockets of whiteness, those are the pockets of richness. And if you look at the spaces of blackness or non-whiteness, those are the spaces where there's less wealth. For you to get your bearings, this is the Lagoa da Pampulha right here. So yellow would be sort of middle in terms of white, and then we're sort of middle to high. So like that's Bandeira, and she's like those really nice mansions that you guys saw along the lakeside. So there's obviously some correlation. There's obviously something going on in between them. So this disaggregation of what the race effect is versus the income effect is very difficult to put together. Um, and some of the work that I'm currently doing is exactly looking at what happens when you have this kind of distribution? How does it affect and, and this kind of income distribution? So if you don't have different races all living in the same areas, if they're all sort of spread out in the city, what, is, what changes in terms of what kind of shopping malls are there? What changes in terms of the bus routes? What changes in terms of how safe you feel? What we have noticed is in the past 15 years, and I would probably stop us right about 2016-17, um, we have a new chapter. It'll be interesting to see what the new chapter brings. Um, we really have had redu reductions in racial inequality. Why have we had some reductions in racial inequality? Because we've had more economic opportunity and we've been able to diminish income inequality. And since there is this um, correlation between income and race, when we deal with income inequality, it helps us with racial inequality. So what we've seen over the past 15 years is that the gaps between, for example, years of schooling between people who identify as black, brown, and white have gone down. And we've seen that income levels have gone up. And also, one of the reasons we've seen income levels go up 
is because we've seen less disparity in between occupations. So we're seeing more racial diversity in occupations than we had seen before. And if more people of different racial categories are in the high paying occupations, then that overall is going to make income inequality better. How has this happened? There have been a couple things, and both of these things are subject of a lot of debate and a lot of discussion. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what the data says. Okay? We have a social program which is called Bolsa Familia. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone heard of this? The family, family program? So what do you know about it? Uh-huh. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mhm. Yes. So in the um in the late 1990s in the government of Itamar Franco I mean, um, not it, my Franco, um, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, uh, there were some income supplement programs. There was one for school, so if your kids went to school, you got an income supplement. There were different income supplements. And when Lula won the election in 2002 and began his government, they decided to sort of take all of these programs and put them under one umbrella and call it Bolsa Familia and they expanded it. And the idea was, is that you would give a cash distribution to the very poorest of the poor. But that cash came with some strings. And so, for example, you'd get a certain amount of money per child, but your child had to have an attendance record in school of over 80%. You would get the money if you were an expecting mother, but your monthly payment was going to be dependent on you going to a certain number of prenatal consultations. So there were always conditioners to receiving this money. And the idea was is that this cash influx of the poorest of the poor would make a big difference. It would mean that the children of these families could stay in school. And if the children of the families could stay in school, then they would have better jobs in the future and it would allow people to um, improve their situation. The studies that have been done over time for Bolsa Familia have really shown that it has had a remarkable impact on income inequality and that it really has raised the poorest of the poor out of poverty and given them sort of a baseline from which they can get a job, which they can make sure their children stay in school, in which they can purchase better food so that they have better income or better nutrition levels. The problem with Bolsa Familia is that people are getting money. You know, the society, the Brazilian taxpayers are giving people money. And Philosophically, for a lot of people, the idea of income transfer, you're taking from me who works hard and pays taxes and giving it to people who don't do anything, philosophically, that is difficult for many people. If we're trying to build a society on meritocracy and a society where everybody has a contribution, then this idea that there's going to be a wealth transfer and that people are just going to get money for nothing is philosophically a difficult thing to understand. You know, we're having the same debates in Europe about universal basic income, because we're talking about the fact that a lot of jobs are going to be on top, you know, we're going to have autonomous, robots are taking over a lot of our jobs, and so you're going to have a lot of people that no matter how much retraining we do, they're not going to have a job, and so perhaps the solution is universal basic income. 
And a lot of people are going, wait a minute, you get nothing for money for nothing? There's, there's, philosophically, there's an issue with that. Additionally, there was a discussion about how do we choose who gets Bolsa Familia? And there was discussion about whether or not there were proper selection criteria and were there people who were trying to game the system? Are there people who really didn't deserve Bolsa Familia, who were just sitting on their butts and getting all this money? Um, and unfortunately, in every single public program that you have in any country in the world, you're always going to find somebody trying to take advantage. And so when we have one, two, five cases of people taking advantage, those get brought into the media, and that's what people think about. The same thing happened in the United States in the 1980s and 1990s when you talked about the welfare queen. Oh, these people, they're third generation, and they're on welfare, and they don't do anything, and they just suck up money. So that's the political debate about Bolsa Familia and why it has been criticized by some people. It's very philosophical in nature. This idea that, no, everybody should be contributing, and if I'm contributing, why should I have to pay for somebody who's not contributing? So it's, it's, a very, it's sort of a philosophical discussion. It goes back to liberal economic, poli uh, liberal economic philosophy about what our role in society is. The data, in fact, has shown that Bolsa Familia has been incredibly successful, and that in fact, the criteria to identify who needs Bolsa Familia has been actually pretty spot on. So the data doesn't really line up with the political argument. The other issue has been expansion of opportunity in the university system. And that began originally with this idea of racial quotas. Um, the idea that we were going to reserve some spaces for people that were identified as black and brown. That became really complicated, and there were a couple celebrated cases, because of this distinction that I talked about earlier between how I identify myself and how somebody else sees me. And so there was a very famous case of twins and the twins had different color, but they were both identifying themselves as brown, although one of them was much more light-skinned. And so they said, well, wait a minute. And there was actually another case recently about a racial quota for a um, public sector job. And the person identified himself as brown and when he took his picture to be evaluated, he did it with a filter and like sort of in a strange lighting. And if you see any other pictures of him or any other images of him, he's very light skinned. And so there have been a couple of celebrated cases that has shown that if our racial quotas depend on somebody looking at a picture or looking at a person and making a determination, we have a very fluid definition of how much brown is brown enough. And that's complicating in terms of this idea of how do I identify versus how do other people see me. More recently, the quota has been linked to those people who went to high school in a public high school. And so it has been much more income-based quota than a race-based quota. But because of the fact that still in Brazil, the people that go to public high school overwhelmingly, besides being of lower socioeconomic status, are also of brown and black cate racial categories, it also helps with the racial inequality. The other thing that's made a bigger impact in terms of educational opportunities was the fact that in the 2000s, beginning in 2002, 2003, um, and through both of um, Ignacio Lula's presidencies and continuing on with uh, Gilma's presidency, we had a huge expansion of the university system. And so the first thing that happened was the federal government subsidized scholarships 
for the private universities. It was called ProUni. And so it used to be that every single university had their own admissions exam. And you took an admissions exam that was specific to the area of study that you wanted. So in Brazil, when you begin your first year of university, you already know I am studying medicine, or you already know I am going to be a biologist, or I am only studying social science. And it used to be that your admissions test was only about that. And it was very specific to each university. They developed a more standardized test, which they use nowadays for all of the universities, the private and the public universities. And when they developed this test, they said that if you scored a certain amount on this test, which was going to be a general language and math test, and it was what you should know, you know, it's a basic, it's language, math, and the subjects that you should know in high school. And based on what, how well you did on the test, that would determine what kind of scholarship you could get at a private university. And so immediately that opened up possibilities for people that couldn't get into the public university where there's no, um, uh, there's no fee to attend the public universities in Brazil to go to private universities. And so that immediately affected those who didn't get, couldn't pay for a private, uni private high school education, didn't have the skills to pass these very specialized exams to get into the public universities, and could go to private university on a scholarship. Then the second wave of that, which was called Heoni, basically um, gave incentives to each of the federal universities to increase the number of students that they would take in in each of their courses and to come up with a whole bunch of new courses primarily courses that would happen at night so basically the quantity of university students that the federal unit like a federal university like ours could accept each year doubled between having more persons of that you, so instead of only taking 40 people in social science, you'll take 80 now. And on top of that, we're not just gonna have social science, we're gonna have anthropology and archeology, span we're gonna have public administration, we're gonna have public, we're gonna have international relations, uh, we're gonna have three or four more courses that have to do with studying society. And so this more than doubled the amount of spaces that we had in the public university. So you have that, and on top of that, you're giving preference for part of those spaces to only go to people who went to public high school. So those two things have really changed the university composition. Did you have a question? I began teaching at the university in 2003 as a postdoc, and I have really seen my students look different. I have a much more diverse group of students sitting in my lectures now than I did when I started in 2003. Social science had, um, you know, was a much more elitist course than it is now. And so I've really been able to see the difference. And so if you have more students coming in, then you'll have more students being trained as doctors and lawyers and engineers and computer um, technicians and sociologists, etc. So those things have really changed and really opened up some of the income equality. And that's part of the reason why there is apprehension, particularly in the university system, about what are the plans for the changes in the university system in this new presidency. Because there's a question of whether or not we'll be able to continue with as many classes as we have, as many courses as we have. On top of racial inequality, we also have gender inequality in Brazil, and gender inequality has gotten much, much better. So the most marked um, measure of gender inequality that we've seen change over time has been access to education. 
Currently, women in Brazil have more years of schooling than men, and it wasn't always that way. So we had a huge shift beginning in the 1970s when girls were going to school. And now, girls go to school for more years than men do in Brazil. Increased access to education has also given increased labor market participation. And so um, we've seen women enter into the workforce more and be more present in different sectors of the workforce more than we saw maybe 40, 50 years ago. And we're also seeing that even though there is an income, an earning distribution, so women make less money than men overall, but that has also been going down. So if we look at, for, if we looked at people who were born in 1963, and we look at adults born in 1963, and where did they go to in terms of schooling? So, how many of these went to school and finished school? So, in urban areas, you had 83%, almost 84%, that of those born in 1963, going to school, having gone to school, right, and being matriculated in school. 20 years later, that goes up from 83% to almost 91%. So if we say, you know, if we look at those people who were born in 1963, how much schooling did they complete? Did they go to school? Were they matriculated ever in school? And really, we can see a huge difference with the Northeast. In women, men and women born in, women that were born in 1963, only about 59% of them went to school. But those born in 1983, so if we're looking at this data in 2000, we're looking at maybe 2000 census data, and we say, okay, if you were born in 1963, what was your schooling experience like? Well, I didn't go to school. If you were born in 20 years later, and you ask, well, did you go to school? Well, in the Northeast, now you have 86% said, yeah, I went to school. I at least had some school. And you can actually see how much that went up. When you compare men and women, only 72%. There wasn't a huge gap between men and women. It was still really low. You only had about 70% of the Brazilian saying, yeah, I went to school. But for those born in 1983, more women said they went to school and finished school than men did. And so that's where we are now. We had a huge, we had a break around 1970 going into 1980 where women began to go to school and stay in school longer than men. We still have a bit of a ways to go. Down here, it's really hard to see, but I'll show where the line is. This was 1982. This is the percentage of black people by 17 and 18 years old in 1982 that had finished elementary school, eighth grade, by 17. Okay? That's not even 20%. Brown people, it ends right around here. And for white, it ends right around here. And this is the amount of people. So, and now here is the 2007 data. So in 2007, if you ask a 17-year-old who identifies as black in Brazil if they finished elementary school, you had almost 80%. So it went from less than 20 to almost 80. 
And in the white, it went from a little over 40 to almost 90%. So we still have a ways to go because we're talking here, we're talking about this is eighth grade right here. And this second bar are those that are transitioning to high school. So if you ask them whether they're completing high, whether 17 and 18 year old, they have any high school. This shows us the university education. And this is really interesting because you can really see the changes by gender and also by race. Because this is, 2003 was pretty much before Heuni and just when ProUni, which was the, the private university scholarship program. And then 2009, it's in full force. This is right when you know, Heuni was beginning around 2009. So basically, 2003 to 2009 is just showing the impact of the scholarships for private university. And so this is the line for black women in 2003, and then this is the line for black women in 2009. This is black men. This is white women. And this is white men. So you can see that this went down a little bit, but this went up quite a bit. So we begin to get a much more diverse population university-wise. And this gives us data that goes all the way up to 2014. And so this is the Brazil line. And this is white women. Yeah, this one is white women. So you can see how that line goes up. These are just women. This is just men. And then this is black women. You can see how here, how they start out way below and how that line just keeps growing. So we have had some gains when we're talking about reducing inequalities. So in general, black and brown have fewer years of schooling and less income. But that, tre excuse me, that trend is decreasing. So we have noticeable gains in education beginning in 2000. And we have gains in the proportion of qualified labor force. So when we want to look at what is the racial composition of doctors in Brazil? That's changing. What is the racial composition of engineers in Brazil? That's also changing. So in 1980, if we looked at you know, doctors and engineers and lawyers, we only had 11.5% in those categories that identified as black. Today, or 2010, our last census data, we have 33.8%. And for women, we see a steady change in labor force participation. So by working on these differences in access to education, we've really been able to work on and see trends decreasing in income inequality. Now, it's important to note that Brazil had a very substantial commodities boom from about 2005, 6 until about 2012. And the fact that there was more commodities, more um, beef, steel, iron, oil, etc., soybeans being sold, that meant that there was a lot more income coming in and a lot more tax revenue coming in. So a lot of these social programs, which provided 
the opportunity, the expansion of educational opportunities, which is driving a lot of this decre decreasing trends in inequality, depended on heavy investments by the federal government. And now we're at a time where we're in a economic recession and the federal government has, not only the federal government, but the state governments as well, have less income, they have less tax revenue. And so now we are really debating and really having a, uh, a challenge for how are we going to continue with some of these expenditures. And we have actually two things going on. We have a real fiscal crisis where even if we wanted to continue on the level of investment that we did 10 years ago, we don't have the money. But we also have a philosophical crisis about whether or not that is how we should be spending the money. Or whether we should be focusing on more market-oriented solutions. I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip the last part of that because uh, otherwise I won't be able to talk about crime and we all want to talk about crime, right? Because <laughs> I just looked and we only have about, you know, about 35 minutes left and I really do want to talk about other inequalities in Brazilian society. So when we're looking at social inequalities. The same reason when we were looking at, okay, what are the inequalities in education or what are the inequalities in income? We had this discussion about uh, they don't have less income because they're black, they have less income because they're poor. We have the same discussion when we talk about criminal justice and crime in Brazil. And we try to try, we try to look at, well, are the representation, are the over-representation of brown and black people in the criminal justice system, is that a racial discrimination or is that an effect of other factors? And some people would argue that um, poverty and income is related to crime. So what we're looking at and what I want to talk about a little bit is show a little bit about what is the situation in Brazil in terms of who are the victims of crime? Who are the people who are in the criminal justice system? And we can sort of talk a little bit about the same sort of conundrum that we had when we talked about income and education, about trying to disaggregate measures of inequality or measures of class versus impacts of race. So. In case you didn't know, there's a lot of crime in Brazil. And hopefully none of you will experience this firsthand. This is the homicide rate from 2017, which is our most recent data. And this is by state. So this shows you that we have a lot of variation. So your risk, you know, whether or not you die of homicide in Brazil, depends a lot about where you live. So for example, here in Sao Paulo, the homicide rate is only 10.7 per 100,000. But up here in Rio Grande do Norte, it's 68 per 100,000. Where's Minas? Minas is right here, 19.6. So still pretty high. You know, the United States as a whole, I think now the homicide rate for the nation as a whole is about eight per 100,000. Um, and most European countries are much below that. Um, we are, uh, it used to be that in Latin America, Brazil had the highest homicide rate. Uh, we don't have the hom highest homicide rate anymore, that uh, honor or if you wanna call it, that's Venezuela now. Um, but ours is still pretty high if you look at us through Latin America. So as you can see through state, this is a map of Brazil. And here are where the low homicide rates are. 
and here where the high homicide rates are. This is very different than the way it was in the 1990s. In the 1990s, all the action was down here. All the action was in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. How many of you have seen City of God? The movie City of God? Uh, the movie City of God is based on a historical novel written by Paulo Genis, and he was a resident of City of God, and it chronicles the rise, the violent rise of the drug trade in the favelas in Rio in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, nowadays, the action is up here because the drug gangs in the south and southeast have moved into these areas and are controlling distribution, not just nationally, but internationally. And so a lot of people talk about the high homicide rates in the north and the northeast, the north specifically, um, because one, the major drug gang in Sao Paulo, PCC, has gone into these areas and dominated the market up there. And part of the reason some researchers feel that Sao Paulo now has such a low homicide rate is because there are no more warring factions. PCC owns everything. And so there, you don't have territory wars, and therefore you have less homicides. Um, it's a little bit of the same argument that was made in the United States in the 1990s when the homicide rate lowered in Chicago and lowered in Los Angeles because the, tough, the, the territorial wars between the gangs were resolved and therefore there wasn't any more fighting and there was fewer homicides. This is going to show us the difference. So is it going up or is it going down? So on this side, you've had an increase over the past year, past five years, in your homicide rate. And here is where the homicide rate is going down. So minus, we're on the downside. So that's a good thing. But you can see Ceará, Acre, Pernambuco, Rio Grande do Norte, they're all going up. And that's been the new story about homicide in the 21st century, is that the homicide rates have gotten much, much higher in the north and the northeast than in the south and the southeast. And so, for example, oops. so who are the victims of violent death in Brazil? They are increasingly young. And that's nothing new. That's a pretty much an international trend. Yeah. So here, what do we have? These are people born in 1980. And so these people, and so where, when are they mostly dying? So those that were born in 1992, born in 2000, and 2000, this is 2010. So we're looking at different cohorts. So if we looked at the data in 2010 or 2080, this was mostly when they died. So the 20s, the high peak was between 20 and 30. And that's just increased substantially. So you have the majority of people dying you know, as we go on in Brazil we've had a higher percentage of youth dying of violent deaths than people that are older than 30, 32. So it's a very specific time point. And there's a lot of different reasons for this. Um, there are reasons related to the fact that people who are young usually are involved in risk behaviors so you go out, you drink, you're out late. Um, it is definitely the time that people would be involved. That's the lifespan and the specific time when people would be involved in illegal activities such as drug trafficking. Um, but this is not very different than anywhere else in the world. What is a little bit different is the high peak 
and the higher percentage of our youth that are, uh, that are dying from violent deaths. So we have a higher percentage. The percentage of people who die in this area is going up over time. And that's a difference for Brazil. So here, you can see, over time, and this is 2008 data, so this is 2018, what is the rate of homicide of people 15 to 29 years old? And so for each of these spikes is a year, and for each of those years, they looked at what's the total population of the country that's between 15 and 29 years old, and then what is the rate of homicide? How many people were killed in that age group? So in 1996, that's really high. So 40, for every 100,000 people in Brazil that were between 15 and 29, so you guys, you had 47.37 people dying. Well, in 2018, that goes way up to 65.51. So the trend that we're having in Brazil is that people who are, vi who are dying violent deaths, and so we're talking primarily, so we're talking homicide, we have a higher percentage of people dying by homicide in that age group, in that young age group. They've always been the high-risk group, and now that's going up even more so. We also have data that shows quite convincingly that we are having an increasing number of people who identify as black. And in this case, the black includes black and brown, so it would be non-white, are those that are victims of homicide. And so here, you see how they've basically switched places. In 2004, you had about 38% of all the homicides were, not, were white. And now you have about 14%. Oh, wait, hold on. OK. I'm sorry, hold on. It's different scales. So this scale here follows these numbers. So it went from about 19 to 16%. And black homicide went from about 31% all the way up to 39, almost 38.5%. So we have different scales on each side. So what is happening is We've taken a situation where those who were victims of homicides were usually young and non-white, and that has gotten more acute over time. These are the homicide rates overall. So these are any homicide, irregardless of age, and this is the homicide rate for black. And when I say black, I'm talking black and brown categories together. So you can see how it's gone up over time. We were having, so this sort of shows us ninety-six. So it starts at ninety-six. And so this peak in 34-4 was in 2003. And now this new peak here has gone up. So when we compare, now we can compare men and compare them out by 
white and non-white. And so this is the line for men. And so this is the age curve. So this is the age at which men die of violent deaths. And so you can see that this is the age curve generally. And we see that this is the space from 15 to 29. But what we see is when we disaggregate it and we say, okay, well, let's look at white men and non-white men separately. This is the curve for white men. Those are the probabilities. So you have like a 6% probability. And up here, you've got like an 18% probability. So you can really see the discrepancy racially when you look at who are victims of homicide. So the composition of homicide in Brazil isn't necessarily different. Like if we were to compare it to the United States, which has a pretty high homicide rate, you would also say that people who are young and people who were African-American descent or that were African-American would have higher rates of homicide. What's striking in Brazil are two things. First of all, the volume. We have a much higher homicide rate overall than many, many countries. And it's been high for a long time, and it's going up. And on top of that, the concentration. So we have a very strong concentration, a high concentration of youth. And then the striking difference between the probability and the risk for those that are white versus those that are non-white. And that's even, there have, because of this discrepancy, there have been scholars and political activists who have begun to use the term genocide. And that in Brazil we have a black genocide. Because overwhelmingly, we have such a strong discrepancy between what is the risk of dying young if you're a black male or a non-white male versus a white male. So that's one part of the equation, you know. The other part of the equation is not just what is the violence rate, but what is the state response to violence? And there's been discussion about is there racial discrimination in the criminal justice system? And really, if we look at it, what are the rates? of non-white people or black people in the prison system versus the population in general. And so in every case, the light blue is the percentage of people who are non-white that are in prison compared to the percentage of non-white people in the population. So if we look at the North, for example, 76% of the population in the North is non-white. So it's either black or brown or indigenous. And 83% of the population of prison is non-white. This gets very striking when we look at the Southeast. The Southeast, as we were looking at, has a lower percentage of non-white people. So that percentage is 42%, whereas in the prison system, 72% of people in the prison system are non-white. And so this raises a question about whether there might be discrimination. Part of the argument is that we're putting in prison the people who are doing the violence. Because we also know that there is a correlation, there are similarities between characteristics of victims and characteristics of perpetrators. So for example, if young people are more likely to die, well, young people are more likely to kill them. So we do see some similarities. But there have been arguments and studies about whether there is, in fact, some sort of racial discrimination or differential treatment based on racial classification in the criminal justice system. Um, Brazil has a system where anyone who cannot afford their own lawyer 
has a public defender. We've done studies that look at the likelihood of getting a sentence or being absolved based on whether you have a lawyer or not. Those that have a private lawyer are more likely to not be sentenced than those who have public defenders. The percentage of people who have public defenders tend to be poorer. The percentage of people who have public defenders tend to be racially classified as black or non-black. And so we again see this combination of class, income, and race. Before I f talk about some other things, were there some questions that you had about, because I have lots that I can talk about crime. I just looked at a little bit of the homicide data and a little bit of the prison data, but there's, there's a lot out there that I could talk about if you want, if you have questions about. Did my whole doctoral dissertation on favelas and gangs and drugs, so, yeah? About what? Mm -hmm. There's a very rich literature, and I participate in this literature, about um, the favelas, in, specifically in Rio de Janeiro, the favelas, um, which are the um, informal housing, and the impact that, that uh, the drug trafficking had on that. Um, specifically in the 1990s up until like the mid-2000s. Um, and a lot of discussion about exactly how those organizations work and what, what terminology we want to use for drug trafficking. Whether it's organized crime, whether it's a faction, do we call it a gang, what exactly do we call it? Um, and yes, um, just like what Venkatesh had noticed in Chicago, you do have um, hierarchies about people have different jobs, um, and so there's different entry levels. Um, what is interesting about all of the literature that was produced um, in the, probably starting with Alba Zaluaz, A Revolta Máquina in 1985 and continuing up until the early 2000s, about mid 2000s, that was all focused on Rio de Janeiro and some on Sao Paulo, was that you had this idea that that's the way drug trafficking works in Brazil as a whole and also that um, every, that, that Rio is the, um, the typical case. And what we found out is that um, youth violence in Brazil is very different. So, for example, in Belo Horizonte, we have a very different situation. We have youth gangs that defend territory that don't necessarily traffic drugs. And so it looks a lot more like U.S. style gangs, um, especially like when we think about Los Angeles, the Bloods and the Crips and this idea of territory, but without the idea of drug trafficking. Although there is 
drug trafficking in, Bra in Belo Horizonte, and there are gangs involved in drug trafficking. But you also have other areas which, through um, vendettas between two gangs, have created high levels of homicide in that area that have nothing to do with drugs at all. And then you have areas, for example, in Brasilia and other areas where the gangs have much more to do with subcultures like funk or tagging or graffiti. And so what's been really interesting for us, I would say about 2005 on, is to really look at the heterogeneity or the diversity that we have in youth violence. But yes, we do have, you know, and I, I spent a lot of time trying to understand what it was like to live in the favela and what it was like to live in the favela with the traffickers as a presence. Um, and Venkatis does a little bit of this too. He talks about informal economy. Um, and my focus was looking at how neighbors solve their problems. So for example, you know, my dog is barking too much or I'm gonna build a new window. And so I looked at neighbor problems. Um, and so, but there was a lot of discussion and a lot of focus on, and in part because Rio and Sao Paulo were driving the, the homicide rate, you had to study the problem in Rio and Sao Paulo. The unfortunate side effect of that is that now we think that all violence in Brazil is, is city of God violence, and it's not. Although drug trafficking has a lot to do with it. Um, and what's, what's been interesting now, we have two things that have come up. One has been the um, expansion of consolidated drug organizations, specifically PCC and um, ADA, which is the offshoot of um, ADA and Comando Vermelho, into other regions of Brazil. And then specifically in the Rio de Janeiro case is the rise of the militias. Um, which has taken on a, speci a, 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 potential, a, a political element in our current situation because there have been um, accusations of association uh, that members of the president's family have associations with militias. Um, and the militias um, grew up as also ways to control areas, um, usually retired police officers, um, but they have grown, and, and they used to be installed in areas as a way for drug traffickers not to enter in the areas. Um, but they have become uh, forces that dominate, um, you know, they've had um, kitchen gas rackets, um, informal transportation racket. Um, the large one now that's happening in Rio de Janeiro, which is the um, um, real estate racket. You know, we had in, in Rio de Janeiro about four or five months ago, you had two apartment buildings that were built without permits and sort of informally, even though they look like, you know, really nice apartment buildings, they fell down, um, killing 22 or 23 people. Um, and the acquisition of the land and all the permits and everything, that was all run by the militias uh, who now dominate certain areas. And so they've... Um, and now, as far as I know, also are, are involved in drug trafficking. So in Rio now, you have a, it's, you have a different, it's a different soup. You have a, many different things going on. But one of the things that I found interesting um, is that once, once you leave Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, and perhaps one of the, I don't want to say benefits, but one of the consequences of the crime rate changing and moving to different regions of Brazil is that we've begun to really look about the fact that we have diversity in the patterns and the causes of youth violence in Brazil. Any other questions? Uh-huh. Mm. There is, um, there is a phenomenon of favela chic, where suddenly favelas are sort of chic. That's more of an international phenomenon than a national phenomenon. However, when funk music exploded in the 
late 90s and early 2000s in Rio, people from the fashionable South Zone would go to the funk parties in the favelas and the west part of the city um, and to be part of that. So there is a little bit of that. Um, less so, Rio de Janeiro is really interesting because Rio de Janeiro is very attuned to, your identity is very constructed, in the city of Rio de Janeiro, your identity is very constructed based on the neighborhood where you live. That's the first question that anyone will ask you in Rio. Where do you live? And from that, they will, they will create a whole series of understandings about who you are. So, and there are real social barriers about moving from one you know, social class to another. Um, but there was a time, and I don't know if it's prevalent so much anymore, but when funk really exploded and was on the national stage the, for the first time, really became part of the national cultural conversation, um, it wasn't unheard of for, you know, upper middle class girls and upper middle class guys to go to the favelas. And also, too, carnival changes things, too, because when people, people will always go to the favelas to go to the samba rehearsals when they start up in January. When they start up in earnest in January, people, that's, you know, people from all different walks of life will go to the different favelas, especially the ones that are in the top ranked of the samba schools. Um, so there is a little bit of mixing, um, but not as much as what Venkatesh was talking about with, you know, I'm going to try and be one. Um, in terms of people in the favelas, there is... There continues to be a stigma associated with living in a favela, and here in Belo Horizonte, they don't call them favelas, they call them villas. Um, so, for example, Villa da Serra, different areas, to the point where people will say that they live in the neighborhood adjoining the favela. They won't say they live in the favela when they're going for a job interview. Um, eh, so, I would say that people from the favela aren't so much trying to aspire or take on mannerisms of the elite, but definitely the, the middle or upper middle class to not be identified. You know, the idea, the word favelado, if you call someone a favelado, it means not only that they live in the favela, but that they incorporate all of the stereotypical um, loudness, dirtiness, uh, laziness that has traditionally been associated with the favela. And so even people living in a favela will say, don't act like a favelado. So I would say it's more that than necessarily this link for things. And it has to do with escaping the stigma. Uh-huh, you had a question? What are you considering securitization? What are, how are you defining that? Okay, well, the, the issue about fear of crime and perceptions of safety has been a constant. Um, 
and that goes up and down. Crime in general didn't really become an issue for elections until probably the 2000s in terms of national elections. It was always an issue for state elections and for city elections. Um, but as far as a national discourse and the idea that you had to have a national security crime plan, that's relatively new. That comes from the 2000s on. Um, there is, without a doubt, um, a, a, a culture war going on. Um, and again, it's hard to know how much of this is happening between the people who speak the loudest and how much of this is really part of the full national discourse. Uh, we try to have some survey data nationally that gives us an idea. Um, overall, acceptance of LGBTQ in Brazil is improving, but we've always had um, high rates of homophobia and higher rates of violence against members of the LGBTQI community than in other countries. Um, so that that's a trend that's getting worse but it's not something that is just happened now um, you do get a sense of the pendulum of progressiveness having swung too far for a lot of people's comfort level and I, I personally have an opinion about politics in terms of a pendulum and it could be that some of the progressive um, policies are generated a backlash from people who weren't quite ready for that social change. Um, one of the things that was really interesting and that has less to do with the LGBTQ and has more to do with access to university and this idea that um, the middle class and the upper middle class there were portions of this population that really felt that public university and public sector jobs were part of their domain. And this idea that now they have to compete for them and that they're uh, people that they didn't expect or didn't assume would be able to have certain opportunities. You know, there was a lot of talk on social media like, oh, I can't believe now, you know, they let anybody fly the in, in the airplane and, you know, I can't believe now my maid could go to Paris and, you know, what is the world coming to? And, and trying to deal a little bit. Now, there's a wonderful film called What Time Will She Be Back? Which really, if you haven't seen it, I would definitely see it. It's very interesting. It's a, it's a, it follows a live-in maid in Sao Paulo, and her grown-up daughter comes to Sao Paulo to take the entrance exam to the same university as the young boy of the family. And she stays with her mother in the house, the family. And she has a completely different view of social relations between social classes than her mother does. And it's really interesting to see that play out. It's, it's, it's a really interesting um, uh, cultural look at some of those changes, some of those progressive changes. Um, so, so I think definitely there are cultural wars. Um, the um, members of evangelical churches and the evangelical church leaders have a much more rigid idea of um, society and social roles and social norms and they have consistently gained more political power <clears throat> and so that brings the discussion about the role you know, social roles and what are social roles and what is it you know what can women do what can men do you know what is gender or not gender um, into the forefront as um, leaders that embody much more traditional social roles for men and women in particular um, gain more political power. So there's that part with the culture wars, I feel. And then the whole part with the securitization, um, the major change right now is the discussion about um, um, gun ownership. That's the major thing that's changing. Um, the rest of it in terms like the fortification of houses and closed communities, that's an old process that began in the 1980s. And Teresa Caldera has a wonderful book called City of Walls. 
um, it's both in English and in Portuguese, that really talks about how that phenomenon began in Sao Paulo. Um, so that sort of secretization and, and this idea that you have to protect yourself um, and ideas about who's a good citizen and not a good citizen, those are older tropes. What's changing now a little bit is there have been two things. One has been this push by the current administration to uh, loosen the controls on gun ownership and gun use. And then in conjunction with that, the, uh, the uh, legislation that the justice minister put forth before Congress um, loosens or softens, ex it expands the definitions of use of lethal force for the police. So the police can use lethal force if they're feeling scared. Um, so the, 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 the criteria for use of lethal force for the police in that legislative project has been expanded, has been the, 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 the bar is much lower. And so there's an argument that that is going to, you know, those of us who study crime feel that if you give the police free reign, um, you're going to incite more violence. And we have evidence of this because in Sao Paulo in the 1990s, there was an informal policy that the more criminals you killed, you would get a bonus. And we saw the crime rate spike tremendously in Sao Paulo in the 1990s. And so when we look at the data, we have evidence that these kinds of policies, they don't really work. Um, so those are the two new ones, I would feel, that are really, that are new in the, in the equation. Um, the other issue is the whole discussion of, you know, who, who's a criminal and who's a good person. That is a discourse that's very old. In fact, the traffickers themselves use those discourses um, when they decide who they punish or don't punish. Um, I don't know. Did I answer your question? But those are, those are old tropes that are coming back a little bit. Any more questions? Yes? Yes. Uh-huh. Um, we are seeing, um, we have the, the percentage of women, or the, femi femicide is, is increasing, and it's been increasing from about 2014 on. Um, we can't, we can't really use, we don't really use the same terms. Um, I don't use the term genocide of the black population. It's a term that some researchers and many social activists are using. Um, but it's rooted in the fact that really we see a huge discrepancy between risk rates between non-white and white people, um, young people particularly. Um, what we are seeing is that there were a series of um, policy and laws that were passed um, over time. One was the Maria da Peña law, which was a law that um, worked to protect victims of domestic violence and to have stronger penalties for people who committed domestic violence. There was the establishment of specific police stations for domestic violence and specific procedures for people who had um, cases of sexual violence. Um, in addition to that, um, there was legislation that was created that specified femicide so that there would be a different treatment for the murder if the murder victim was a woman. What we see in the rhetoric of the current administration is that those policies are going to be changed. Nothing has happened. Um, I personally, for my own mental health, I try not to get too upset when, peop when someone says something until I actually see something happen about it. So, um, you know, almost every day the president says something crazy or something that is disconcerting. And therefore, I, you know, I can't, you know, if I were to get upset and think that the sky was falling every single time, he, you know, went on a live on Facebook, I think that I wouldn't be able to do my job. So uh, definitely the discourse is that there's no need for extra judicial 
um, legis the, for additional legislation that deals with the, the issue of women being victims. We do have victims, women being victims increasing. We have domestic violence increasing, and we have women as a percentage of people who are dying increasing slightly in the past four or five years. We have a discourse currently saying that the existing legislation that was trying to focus on that particular problem is not necessary. So we'll see what happens. Um, as of now, the anti-crime legislation of the justice is still being considered by Congress and it hasn't really gone anywhere. So, But yes, there's, there's definitely that. I wouldn't put it in the same category as what social activists and some researchers are saying about the non-white population where that is really a very striking difference. Any other questions? Okay, just to conclude then, um, when we talk about Brazilian society, and it was quite a big challenge to come up with a lecture that really talked about all of the things, um, we are really looking at a multiracial and a multi-ethnic society. Um, Brazil is very different regionally and we really can't understand the implications of this current composition without really understanding all of these historical and cultural antecedents, which is not my lecture. You guys already got those lectures. So as you can see, when we look at the regional composition that has to do with colonization, we have impacts based on where slavery happened, when it happened, how it happened. We have impacts about migration and income opportunities and educational opportunities based on industrialization and the migration patterns that happened in the first half of the 20th century and into about 1970, 1980. And then if we're looking at the more recent period, we really see how the impact of public policies, specifically based, uh, geared towards access for university education and also in terms of wealth transference, um, have made a difference. And so now we're actually at a point where, um, depending on who you talk to, we're either in a period of correction or we're in a period of dismantleization. So we, we, I honestly can't tell you what uh, we will see. It'll be interesting to see our data from the 2020 census because that'll give us really a sense of the impact of the recession and how much the recession slowed some of these gains in public policies. Um, and then going forward um, throughout this administration up until 2022 to see to what extent um, some of the changes, so for example, we are debating a, uh, a retirement reform and then there's an expectation that there will be a tax reform following it. So those will be very, very interesting to see to what extent those are going to change uh, the composition and the levels of inequality in Brazil. So thank you all very much. <laughs>